Welcome back to the final part of this Equivariant Deep Learning series. In this video, we will have a look at how Equivariants can be baked into the architecture of transformers and GNNs. This means in the following minutes, we will focus on sets, graphs and point clouds. In fact, one of the main motivations for me was to explain how the SE3 transformer works. I didn't think it would be such a long way from group theory over steerability and other mathematical concepts to eventually understand this paper. But here we are and I hope that some of the following is interesting for you guys out there, so let's get into it. Point clouds and graphs fall under the umbrella of sets because they are simply a collection of data points that belong together. You can also see text as a set with each token being a data point. And if we give this set a specific structure, we end up with a graph. Or a point cloud if we also add coordinates. So all of these data structures are somehow connected. Transformers and GNNs are a reasonable choice when working with such data modalities. Transformer models don't really have a strong inductive bias like CNNs do, for example. They are quite flexible regarding the data they are able to model, which is maybe one of the reasons why they are so successful. Of course, given the constraint of having enough data. On sparser datasets, it can make sense to introduce additional biases like done in the SE3 transformer. GNNs, on the other hand, require graph-shaped data because otherwise there will be no message passing between different data instances. On graph data, you can also add coordinates, think of three-dimensional molecular graphs, for example. Both of these model types already carry a special equivariance namely permutation equivariance. Transformers and GNNs are not sensitive to the order of the inputs and they're also able to handle varying sized inputs. They are, however, not rotation equivariant, especially in the context of point clouds. Considering these equivariances can benefit many applications, such as physical particle simulations, molecular predictions, or also geometry datasets. Therefore, in this video, we will dive into some architectures that bake in 3D equivariance. For this, we will first have a look at some foundational papers like SCHNET or tensor field networks. For the following, we focus on the 3D setting, which means besides other information, each of our data points also has a three-dimensional coordinate vector as features. This could, for example, represent a protein graph. The basic idea is that we want the model to ignore the absolute values and instead use the relative information between the different data points, such that if we rotate, the outputs rotate as well without paying attention to the absolute coordinate vectors. In other words, the outputs should behave predictably under geometric transformations. The advantage is that the model doesn't need to learn how global rotations affect the features, which simplifies the learning process. An interesting thing I read is that rotations commute in 2D but not in 3D. What this means is that the order of operations is actually relevant in 3D, which makes constructing rotation equivariant neural networks even more difficult. I constructed a simple example to visualize this. Let's say we have this little box with a blue arrow that points into our direction. On the left we see the coordinate system with three dimensions. Now we perform a 45 degree rotation on the y-axis, which makes the blue arrow point to the left. After that we perform a 180 degree rotation on the z-axis. The blue arrow is now on the bottom of the box and points to the right. I slightly shaded the arrow to indicate that it's not on the top anymore. Now let's do the same but with a different order of operations. We start with the 180 degree flip and after that we perform a 45 degree rotation. As we can see the blue arrow is also on the bottom but instead points into the opposite direction. That's why 3D rotations are not commutative. This has some implications or rather restrictions on the way these models need to be designed as we will see later. In the literature, there have been different ideas to introduce 3D equivariance to neural networks. One of the earlier ones is called SCHNET. It introduces continuous filters that utilize pairwise distances between points to allow for rotation equivariance. 
Continuous here simply means that no discrete grid is used and instead the filter is defined on all points, which is a bit like the approach of PointNet and graph neural networks. This type of convolution is also called point convolution. R, I and J represent the 3D coordinates and the difference or distance between them is what makes the model invariant to rotations. The distance stays constant independent of the orientation. This actually makes this model rotation invariant but not equivariant. A downside of this is that you lose directional information of the vectors. Which for example makes it impossible to distinguish mirrored versions of objects or to predict directional forces. Tensor field networks are now a combination of these continuous filters from Schnett and the idea of basis functions from harmonic networks presented in the last video. Unlike Schnett, TFNs are rotation equivariant. Recall that harmonic networks used circular harmonics in 2D and in tensor field networks the equivalent for 3D is used, namely spherical harmonics. The idea is therefore based on steerability, as the filters in TFNs are composed of spherical harmonics. We will see in a second what exactly is meant by this. The name tensor field networks comes from the fact that the inputs and outputs are n-dimensional tensor fields. Let's say we have a 3D vector plus a one-hot encoded variable as input features. In the following there will be a distinction regarding the type of features. Type 1 refers to 3D coordinates and type 0 to rotation invariant scalars such as the node type. These types later determine how the different parts of such multidimensional arrays behave under rotation. For example type 0 vectors are rotation invariant. Later we will also see the term rotation order which corresponds to these types. The output of TFN layers will be another concatenated multidimensional tensor of different types with clearly defined rotation behavior. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the math to see what is meant by this. In order to understand tensor field networks there are three mathematical terms we need to familiarize with. First of all spherical harmonics. They are a set of functions which are especially popular in physics. You can for example use them to simulate sound waves or the bounce of a ball. In general they are geometric functions which means they map from a geometric point to a value. The beautiful property here is that they are equivariant to rotations. That means if we rotate the coordinate system the output signal stays the same. So that might come in handy if we want to design equivariant neural networks. Mathematically they are defined by the following formula and I've linked a video in the description which derives this expression in case you are interested. Spherical harmonics form an orthonormal basis and as a result any function on a sphere can be defined as the sum of these base functions. It's just like with Fourier transform which decomposes periodic signals. This decomposition of functions using spherical harmonics is a property that tensor field networks will make use of. In the chart on the left you can see a visualization of these harmonics where the rows represent the degree and the columns the order m. The two colors represent if the function values are positive or negative. This kind of visualization can be a bit confusing at first because it's not really clear what these orbits mean. But simply remember that these things are just functions. There's also a second way to visualize this. This example is a spherical harmonic of degree 2 corresponding to three dimensions. The input to the function are x, y and z coordinates of a data point and the harmonic tells us which function value will be assigned. The next term we need to discuss are wigner d matrices. I mentioned before that we distinguish different types of features when dealing with rotations. The Wigner D matrices tell us exactly how these types transform under rotation because they are the irreps, so irreducible representations of the group SO3. They can be decomposed into a block diagonal form. And the interesting part is that the orthonormal subspaces of spherical harmonics, so the basis functions, correspond to these Wigner D matrices. 
In practice, we can now construct tensors based on a combination of spherical harmonics and additionally know how they transform under rotation using these Wigner D matrices. This allows us to follow the rules of equivariance. Finally, klebsch gordon coefficients. These coefficients become interesting once you aim to calculate the product of these composed tensors. Let's say you use this combination of spherical harmonics from above to build a vector. This is what we called a fiber in the last video. In parts of the network, it might be necessary to multiply fibers. The klebsch gordon coefficients tell us eventually which parts we need to multiply with each other. So basically they define the multiplication rules for different tensor types. So these three concepts are used within tensor field networks and hopefully this high level overview was sufficient to gain some intuition about the terms. Probably it was not mathematically precise and therefore please also take a look into a few other resources I've added in the video description. Now let's take a look at the final layer definition of tensor field networks. In order to design 3D rotation equivariant filters, the idea in TFNs is to use a composition of the rotation equivariant spherical harmonics. This makes the filters symmetric. So the filter definition looks like this, where Y are the spherical harmonics and R a set of learnable parameters, also called a radial function. This radial function is implemented as a neural network. Essentially, this defines how the composition of basis functions looks like. There's a bunch of other symbols which I've added here for completeness, but this is not too important for now. The full layer definition of tensor field networks is described by this formula. Here we can find the filter which I've just talked about, and the input for this filter is the difference between vector A and B. A is here the central point and B are all other points within the point cloud. For each of these points we have a feature vector denoted with V. Finally, the klebsch gordon coefficients tell us how to combine the different fibers in a meaningful way. So to summarize this, there are three things happening. First, a continuous point convolution that takes all other points into account. Second, the filters are constrained to be a learnable radial function combined with spherical harmonics. And finally, tensor algebra is used to combine different vectors. Here is also where the non-commutativity of 3D is considered, because this approach is slightly different from what is done in harmonic networks. If you are interested in some hands-on action using TFNs, I've linked a Jupyter notebook in the video description. It mixes some coding with visual explanations, and I think it's a great resource to learn more about these models. Now let's finally move on to the model I originally was interested in, the SE3 transformer. As you by now know, SE3 stands for Spherical Euclidean Group and represents translations and rotations in 3D. It turns out that this model is heavily based on tensor field networks, as we will see in a second. You can also see Max Welling on the list of authors who heavily influenced the field of graph neural networks. This paper on one hand presented an equivariant attention mechanism and on the other hand combines it with graph neural networks. There's a great visual summary of that which I took from the paper. Step 1 is to introduce local neighborhoods and treat them as a graph. This means for each center point, all points within a certain radius based on their 3D distance are selected. The motivation behind this is to make the attention mechanism more scalable because otherwise it has quadratic complexity as each point needs to attend to all other points. The next step is where the tensor field networks comes into play. Instead of using regular weight matrices as in a plane transformer, the space of learnable functions is limited to rotation equivariant kernels based on tensor field networks. This means that all of the components we've learned about before are used here. Spherical harmonics, a learnable radial network and klebsch gordon coefficients. Using these new kernels we are able to override the transformer architecture. For keys, queries and values we have a separate weight matrix that transforms the features in an equivariant manner.
Additionally, the nearest neighbor graph is used to select points that are used for the attention mechanism. Finally, the attention scores are calculated as usual, namely as a dot product of queries, keys and normalized using the softmax function. So the overall trick here is really to re replace all weight matrices with equivariant kernels that were presented in tensor field networks. As a result, the whole attention mechanism is 3D rotation and translation equivariant. If you're interested in playing around with this, there's a public repository with an implementation from the authors. You can dive into the model implementation and get a deeper understanding about how things are put into code. For example, how fibers are implemented or how the forward function of the model looks like. They also point to an updated implementation by NVIDIA, which speeds up calculations significantly. That's all for this video and also the whole Equivariant Deep Learning series. Of course, there are many other interesting models I couldn't talk about here, but I would argue that the aggregated knowledge of this video series is sufficient to understand most of the models out there. I hope you gained some useful insights from this and would be happy to see you again in a future video.